Good to start, Dave? Yeah. All right. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Nolan Swenson. I'm the urban conservationist for the Burley County Soil Conservation District, which owns the Minokan Farm. Has there anybody, anybody who hadn't heard of Minokan Farm before coming here? A couple, all right. Anybody been to the Minokan Farm before? All right. Well, yeah, Bruce, obviously. Okay, well, it's good to have you here. I think I'll just give you a little bit from the farm. The district's well been around since the 40s, and the farm has been around since 2009. And the farm is here as a demonstration farm, which is we like to be called as opposed to like a research farm, where we just do demonstrations that people can come see, and they can go back home, whether it be to a garden or their farm, and think, you know what, I could try that. We're not really into a lot of data gathering and writing research papers and things like that. We're kind of always trying to gather more information and accumulate technology and everything, but technology can sometimes be a hindrance, actually, but, or be used in place of common sense. But, uh, and I, uh, with today, we are doing a, an urban conservation program. Traditionally, the soil district's been involved in more rural agriculture, helping farmers and ranchers. But we're trying to expand into urban conservation to kind of, well, to cover, you know, we are responsible for all, all of the soils county, or all of the county's soil and water resources. And we've been kind of ne neglecting the urban side. So we're trying to fill a gap that's been kind of neglected for a while. So we're trying to teach people about conservation in the urban setting, teach people about rural agriculture and conservation that they didn't know anything about, just so they can be more informed consumers and producers and buyers and everything. So, But this is our first ever workshop like this, and uh, hopefully it goes all right. I think it'll be fine. So everybody seems pretty chill, I guess. Um, I think hopefully there'll be, there'll be, I think probably everybody's got their tools and everything. We're going to start with the rain barrels first. And with the rain barrels, most of the work is actually going to be done when you get home. So those are going to go relatively quickly, and I'm going to build one right along with you. And then after that, we'll do the compost tumbler. And then hopefully you guys are willing to help each other out. But if you want to keep your social distance, that's fine. So we're not going to make any. It's your responsibility to stay safe. So. But, and I guess as far as me, if I seem nervous, it's because I am. And if I talk a lot, and you can see I already do a lot of this, and I make a lot of jokes and weird noises and funny faces. So that's just me. Don't think there's anything wrong. That's just me. So. You guys seem like you probably watched the Dick Van Dyke show, so I'm kind of like Dick Van Dyke used to be tripping over stuff and making funny faces and stuff like that. So, But first off, I guess we'll start with a rain barrel. I think, I don't know, is everybody? It looks like almost all of you are doing a rain barrel, so maybe minus you. So that's all right. So basically for the rain barrel, it's pretty simple. We just have this rain barrel kit, um, and then we just have a barrel, and most of the barrels had, it was a food additive in there, an organic food additive. I cleaned it out the best I could, but there's probably a little, there's a few spots in there maybe, but as long as, maybe if you're not directly drinking the water, you'll be all right. But if you need to scrub it, please do, I guess, whatever you feel comfortable with. So, but I think everybody just open up, why don't everybody just open up your uh, kits and then we'll get started. And if there's anybody watching at home, if you're watching on YouTube, the way I understand it is if you put comments into YouTube, we'll, we should be able to read the comments and, and answer any questions that you have. So that's the plan. But. So to start, we need their, the smallest hole saw. There's a kind of, I'll just call them small, medium, and large. We need the small one. And it'll be the, the medium one and the large one that you use at home. And then we need this plastic spigot. And then there should be this little rubber washer with a pointer with a point on it. That's what we need. So. So I will try to keep my face visible. So uh, on the kit, it says to drill the hole 10 inches up from the bottom of the barrel. 
And I don't know if there's a reason for that. I didn't call the guy. I've talked to the guy that actually owns the company that I got these from. But my opinion is if you drill 10 inches on the bottom, you can't harvest the bottom 10 inches of water. So you just made your 55 gallon barrel a 30 gallon barrel. So, so I drilled that one like four inches from the bottom. And when we drill this bottom hole, I think you have to go really slow. Because if you don't, you kind of wobble the hole out too much. And that little rubber stopper doesn't seat very well because mine leaked yesterday. And it's kind of, it's not a perfect system because I'm sure you could get something where you could stick it in from the inside and then put a nut on the outside, but you can't really stick your hand three feet down into a barrel. So we'll see, I might, I'm sure with enough caulking I can get it to seal, but, yep. The only reason I would think they'd have you do it up high is Sure. And it's up, if whatever, if you guys want to do it 10 inches, you do it whatever you want, but so, but that's a good idea. And I know you want to keep it a little bit from the bottom because, I mean, eventually there's going to be some kind of sediment that gets in there. And I suppose every year you might have to knock it out because I'm sure if you have an asphalt roof, you're going to get a little pebbles in there. And we, had, we actually had one person email us. And so thinking about water running off an asphalt roof, you know, over time you're going to get some, a little bit of chemical in the water. And she was just concerned about if you're growing plants that you're going to eat about getting it into the soil and then uptaking into the plants and eating the chemicals through the plants. I have not done, I mean, I could probably read 100 research papers and they probably, I could find ones that say it's fine and I could find ones that say that don't eat it. But there's, at a certain, you know, at a certain threshold, everything can become toxic, but, you know, but I don't know. Is anybody planning to grow vegetables with this or is it for flowers? So, and we actually had, we had a lady at a conference last November, and she was from Baltimore, and she kind of addressed this issue. And they actually had, they actually still have lead, like water pipes, delivery pipes in Baltimore, very old city. But they had water, or they had lead in the water, in the soil, but their findings were no lead in the plants. So just because the stuff is in the water and the soil doesn't mean it makes it into the plants, but that's kind of, it's up to you what you feel comfortable doing, I guess. But, and if you have a steel roof, it's probably fine. But, so. So, um, I think we'll just, I am again, okay. And so I think I'll just talk about the whole process first before I get too far ahead of myself. So basically where there's three holes you have to drill, you have to drill into the bottom of your barrel and then you'll have to drill an inlet into the top of the barrel. And then, and that's what you slip this other little rubber washer in. And then when you get home, so this is meant for a two inch by three inch gutter, which is a standard size gutter. Some are, the ones I have at home are three by four inch, they're bigger ones. But basically you drill with a large hole saw into the side of your gutter and then you crunch this down and you slip it in the hole and then it pops out and you can see that it'll collect the rainwater. A portion of it, it goes through the middle but this cup catches some of it. And then it diverts it. I think this is called the diverter. Then it'll run into this barrel. And basically, you know, I'm going to drill my spigot on the front so it sticks out from my house. And then if I drill this into my gutter here on my house, you know, I'm going to want my inlet, you know, kind of right here at some odd angle. So when you go home and you finally have this all set up how you want it, you drill this in, put it at the same level, and then you drill this hole. So it all ends up nice. Does that make sense? So you don't, not like mine, mine would be the, like the absolute worst thing to do where I drilled that in, you know? But, but now you can, well, that's a good prop now. Don't do that, okay? Yeah. So we just have, I think hopefully everybody has a drill and then we'll get the, get the small hole saw on this arbor. Just slip it on the back and, and you guys can stand up and work on your table or work on the floor, whatever you guys wanted to do. But I went pretty quick yesterday, so I'm going to take it nice and slow today and we'll see how it goes. The small one, yep. So there's like a there's like a big black nut there. Screw that nut off. So 
Okay, and then you, yep, you'll slip that on and you can see how it slips on there. And then screw that black nut back on and that's how it holds it on. The barrels that I got, so I got these used barrels and I only got barrels that had one plug in them. I went to this guy and he had 30,000 barrels at his farm. So I got what I got basically. But you can just, if you want to plug that, you can order one online for like three bucks. Yeah, or I just, whatever, set a little four inch flower pot on top or something. And, but it's not really for airflow because the air will get in through the inlet basically too, so. All right. And then everybody should have one of these lumber crayons. They actually, they write pretty decent on the barrels. I tried to do carpenter pencil, but it didn't show up, so. And you'll kind of have to drill into the barrel a little bit and then your holes all get clogged with plastic and then pull it out and do that a couple times. So there you should be able to see a hole. I drilled mine five inches up that time. And then if you have, I took a jackknife and I kind of cleaned out that hole a little bit because it's some burrs in there, which might be the reason that my one yesterday leaked. But. Is that doing anything, Margaret? Is that, is your name Margaret, right? Okay. So, this, is that drill set on the lowest speed? Because it sounds like it's really flying, right? Is there a way to set the speed? So, yep, on top of the drill there's that switch. It's on high, turn it to low. So in order to get that not to be too big of a hole, it'll be, and I don't know if you can put it on the ground, but you have to go slow and probably apply a decent amount of pressure to get it to go in.
Is that our drill? There's the same batteries back on that table. You can borrow one of our batteries for now. Hey, you can bring it up here. Bring that battery with you. Oh, maybe was it on on all the way? Or you might have had the trigger like that. Could you pull the trigger at all? Yeah. Okay. Well, it works now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't really realize it was going to be that short. And we have three hours allotted today. If we make it to an hour and a half, we're going to be really doing good. Okay, so take this, this rubber washer with the point on it. Now what you're going to need to do is, if you can, push this down and make it into a U shape kind of, that thing. It's kind of tough. You got to have strong fingers. And basically, you got to pop it in there with the V on the inside pointing down. And if you need to, like, use a screwdriver or something, but it was, it's a little challenging to get it in there. Ready for the next step? Okay, take this little guy. Don't use that guy is for when you get home. That one. So I take mine and bend it into a U shape or a C shape, kind of like that. And then you stick the V on the inside pointing down. And try and make sure you don't lose it. So I guess you could dump it out the top and try again, but that takes a little muscle to get it in there, but. This thing has to be inside. inside pointing down, yep. Oh, the V is inside? Yep. It's a little challenging to get it in there. Yes. And then when we screw the spigot on, it, sh it should expand the, the rubber just a little bit, and it should hold tight. But like I said yesterday, mine didn't turn out so hot. But. And then the other thing is, Cindy, could you bring that dish soap over here? Give me a little dab of that dish soap, please. Just put a, a drop on there. So we'll put some dish soap on the threads and it'll make it a lot easier. Sorry for the people that already done it, but yeah. It should make the threads a lot slipperier to screw them in there. Because when I did it yesterday, my, my rubber ring started to slip a lot. And this is going in a lot easier than it did yesterday.
What do you find? It should? Yeah. That mine wine why mine didn't work? Yeah. And then then when you're tightening the spigot, then you got something. Oh you hold, you can, okay. You can hold on to. Okay. I didn't read the directions very good. So when you did it, did you put the V on the outside or the inside? Outside. Oh, see I read the directions wrong. As Sorry. You, uh, tighten it up, it pulls that fixed Okay. In. Okay. So does your seal up good? It feels like it does. Okay. Well the reason mine didn't work is because I did it completely backward, so. Yeah, and then when and then since the V's on the outside, you have something to kind of hold on to. Well, that's a lot more encouraging now. So. Is your is yours guys is solid? Okay. No. Yeah. How hard is it to get out when it's in there? Tough? There's players back there. I'm sure if you had a players, you could grip on it and tug it right out. Got it? What are you looking at? Making comments? Dave Carpenter? I even did what they said and I built it the day beforehand so I knew what I was doing, but I guess if you don't build it right, it doesn't really matter. I don't know. It's all right. Well, hopefully nobody barrel, nobody's barrels will leak then, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Getting calls saying, why is my barrel leak so bad? Well, I, it still may leak. Yeah, but it's a lot better than it was. Yeah. So. And the thing is, actually, you're good you've got something to hang on. Yeah. That's the only part that so good When I was building it yesterday and I was like, why don't they make something to hold on to? I probably should have read the directions again. Oh. So it should be kind of the, the threads that are longer there. Flip uh, the threads that are in your hand, screw into that uh, rubber. So has everybody gotten that far? Just about it looks like, right? Does anybody have any questions about this at all? Yes. Is it pretty? What's going to be with that? Okay. So now when you get home, you're going to probably set this up on a couple cinder blocks or at the edge of your deck somewhere where you can get a water can under it or hook a hose to it, right? So when you have this set in place, then you take and maybe before you do that, three inches down, I went from the very top of the barrel. You drill with the medium hole saw, you drill a hole again, and then you slip this little rubber 
well, I just call them rubber washers for lack of a better term. Slip that in that hole, you got the one you got there. And you just, whichever hole saw, you can just see which one they match up with. So you're gonna drill it. You know, if this is, if this is sticking straight out from my house, here's my gutter against my house, I'm gonna kinda stick it maybe right here at this odd angle. And then with the large so hole saw, depending on which, you know, this is a two inch by three inch thing here, depending on the orientation of your, whether you drill into the side of your gutter or the directly into your gutter. <clears throat> You're gonna drill with the large hole saw into your gutter. And these hole saws are cheap. They're only meant to, meant to be used once. So, and I'm just gonna say that that's what the manufacturer says. So I'm not gonna say don't save it and be drilling a lot of holes with it. So then you drill that big hole you kind of bend this in on itself again, and you stick this in there and it pops out and you can see that it makes a cup to catch some of the water. And then there should be two self-tapping screws. So the, this big flange will be on the outside of your gutter. You take those two self-tapping screws and screw this to your gutter. So you can imagine in real space, it'll be somewhat maybe like this. And then this, let me suck that together a little bit. Now I got that going in there and this is going in here. These should be level. So there shouldn't be like a drain like this. And you can imagine that a gutter is going here and this is inside the gutter. So, and this expands a lot so you got some flexibility. But, but just make sure before you, especially before you drill into your gutter, you need to know exactly where this is gonna be. So. And then, other than that, I think it's pretty, anybody else have any more questions? So, and then I guess the only thing is, uh, you know, maybe you're gonna just disconnect the flow into the barrel in the winter time, or what they say is you can undo this and just flip this upside down, and then it all runs around it. So you won't catch any water in the winter time to freeze and break the barrel and push your gutters out and things, so. But, but basically there's really, it's pretty minimally, minimally invasive to your gutter. I thought you had to really do a lot of gutter work to build a rain barrel, but the way they make it, it's pretty simple, so. So if the rain barrel is full, yep. then what happens? So if it fills all the way up, is it's going to, yep. Yeah. As long as you keep that below the top level of your rain barrel, so as long as you keep this below the up level, the water will come through and it will flow back to the hole. This is your hole. And so it will cause it to drop back into the gutter. Yeah, any excess water just goes through the gutter, yeah. You get to the height of the water in the rain barrel and then it will overflow. Yeah. Just like your bathtub or your sink goes into the hole. Because 90% of your water runs down the sides of your gutters or your downspouts, which is why it holds tight and then it will fill up. Back down yeah. And that's why it's critical to have it perfectly level, so, right. or else it'll be flowing, it'll end up flowing out the top of the barrel, so. But, and then, you know, make sure it's on a, like a sturdy area, because when this barrel's full, it'll weigh like probably almost 450 pounds. So it's, but, so, but. Any other questions? Questions online? I don't know if they're working or not, but. So is there another? Um, Plug, the ones I got, I just got one with each barrel because I went and got used barrels, the ones I could find. But you can buy a plug on that online for like three bucks. Okay. And I know you might, be able, might even be able to go to the hardware store and find them. But, but it should, both caps can be on. It doesn't like need an air inlet because it'll, I mean, there's air coming in the gutter, so. You won't have any problems with the water flowing out or anything, so, but. So that's a pretty quick project. You know, like I said, most of the work's when you get home, so. <clears throat> Uh, I, at this time, I don't do on-site consultation. Yeah. I think that's actually what my job is, is on-site consultation. But. 
I'll watch you while you do it, then if something breaks, I didn't touch it. No, I think it's fine. No, you'll be all right. Thank you. So, oh yeah. Hopefully you didn't. Well, now you got more free time today, so. <laughs> you blocked off all three hours, so. So. I had no idea what I was yeah. Thank you. yeah. So just take a little break and let everybody get their compost tumbler uh, materials together, so. Uh, I guess I can look them up online to but... Yeah, so. Not for 10 bucks. No, you're gonna pay more for just the kit than you got for everything today. But. Or if you wanna wait, we'll do this again in the fall, I'm sure, and you get one, a whole thing then. But. Good job, Bruce. <laughs> she said, oh, she's probably done it.
All right. Okay, now we're ready to do our compost tumblers, I think. So the first thing, basically with the compost tumbler, you got the barrel, and then you should have a piece of rubber, and then a little, ba a little baggie of parts, and then just a few tools. Hopefully everybody looked at the list and got most of those together, so. Um, so the first thing we gotta do is we gotta cut this hole out. And I know the lady that I learned this from, she said to cut the holes for the people, but that's not very fun, because saws are fun. So, so the easiest way that I did it is I just laid, I just laid my mat on there and I traced around it and then basically we'll go like an inch in on all sides and then that's where we'll cut. Does that make sense? Maybe an inch or an inch and a half, whatever you want to do. I did an inch yesterday and mine actually seems like it'll hold pretty good. So, But hopefully that those yellow lumber crayons will write on here. And if you don't, I have a blue lumber crayon that you can use. And I tried to cut the rubber as square as I could, so. So then I just, I just measure in like an inch on each end of each side. I measure in an inch and a half and then I just use this as a straight edge because it kind of lays there nice. And then I trace a line there. So I got to do that four times. So I did an inch in yesterday and I'm doing an inch and a half now just to see how it ends up. <laughs> and that's probably fine. I don't I just have a little bit of mild OCD, so it's got to be all nice and measured out for me. <laughs> so I'll wait for everybody to get that far. Got her? So then there's probably maybe a couple different kind of saws we're going to use. The best is a jigsaw. May basically take and drill like a, a half inch hole at the opposite corners and then you can make your cuts. So if everybody wants to slowly go through and use a jigsaw, that's probably the easiest and the safest. And then there's also a reciprocating saw. That's probably the most dangerous. I'm going to do it with a, with a circular saw. So whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, so Margaret, are you going to use the jigsaw? So do you have a half inch drill bit? Do you have a half inch drill bit? Okay, come get, come get this half inch one. 
Here, I'll drill my holes quick. Or I don't need it, actually. Or I'll give that to you. So basically on this corner and then the opposite corner, drill that hole. Are you good? Yep, you can. So you've you've drilled your two holes? Yep. She might need that drill bit. I think she drilled holes that were too small. Yeah. Tell her to use that. So if you're going to use a jigsaw and you drill the holes, they should probably be a half inch or else your jigsaw blade will probably get caught and, and kind of jack out of there. Yeah. So.
District? Uh, five, five or six. Wait, and we'll we'll have a, a young guy starting in next week. So, so there's kind of three technicians. There's a person that runs the farm. There's a person that works at the farm, and then we have. Uh huh. Uh, where did you get your wood from? Uh, so we've done it kind of a couple different ways. Uh, because did you see this biochar in the bags over here? I just knew you had a workshop on biochar. Oh, okay. And I didn't get to it, so I was just wondering when you. That was that workshop. We although we held it out here was held by the Forest Service. So that was I really don't know where they got that wood from landfills or from farmers tree rows or what, but. And then we do, I did like a little backyard biochar demonstration where I made it in a, I made, I basically took a pallet and I made it into biochar in a 55 gallon barrel. Just like, that's kind of the homeowner backyard version, so. We have a lot of down wood yep. that my husband's wanting to get rid of and I don't want him just to burn it. Sure. Um, so I'm trying to find somebody who wants it. You know, I don't know. If I had time to come get it, I probably would because I, I heat my house with wood, so. But, or I'd, or I'd run it through my wood chipper, but. Yeah, somebody came and got a bunch of good, good logs. property and I'm just kind of looking for somebody who wants to yeah come you'll have your work cut out for you finding that but somebody who wants to move it so yeah. it's very labor intensive yeah it is um, somebody came out with a claw and moved the big logs yeah you know, kind of a thing because they um, heat with wood sure um, so yeah it's the house all, all the time. I probably heat I probably heat the main part of my house, like probably two thirds of my house, I heat with wood all winter long. So my kids' bedrooms have electric heat in them, but like my my like entryway, my dining room, my living room, and my kitchen is all one big open area. So that I have a, like a wood burning furnace in my back entryway of my garage, and then it's vented into my house. And there's the chimney goes out the roof in the garage. So how often do you have to uh, we pretty much, I'll start a fire in the morning before I go to work at six o'clock in the morning, and then I'll start a fire, uh, like at eight o'clock at night before I go to bed. So I don't really like continuously feed it wood. I just 
completely pack it full and start it two times a day kind of. And that's like if it's, if say if it was 10 below out, that would be fine. So, but then mine also burns coal. So if, if I ever get older, well, when I get older and I don't want to cut as much wood, I'll just buy lump coal and burn it, so. But yeah. <laughs> what all do we grow? So we have 10 fields out here. This is 150 acres. We have 10 fields and two of them are always in like a perennial grass and we graze cattle and sheep and stuff on it. But as far as like crops, this year we have corn, soybeans, peas, rye, we'll have alfalfa, uh, what else do we have? Canola, uh, maybe we'll have flax, sunflowers we've grown. There's not a lot we haven't grown. Triticale, spring wheat, durum I'm sure of it. At one point there was Durham, but yeah. Kind of most everything really that's grown in North Dakota. So. It could be recycled, but that's about it. Just, just lay it by your thing and I'll clean them up later. But. Yeah you, yeah, you don't need that for this project, yeah. All right, everybody's got their holes cut, I think, finally. So after doing that, should I, should I cut the holes for everybody or do you like cutting it? Okay. Should I get another jigsaw so there's more jigsaws? Okay, all right. All right. Yeah, okay. And it's the quietest too, probably. Okay. What's that? Yeah. So the next thing we need to do is before we, okay, another thing I'll say before I forget is people have tried to take this cutout and then use that as a door, but over time this cutout is going to really warp and it's not going to work for long. So that's why we use the rubber as the door eventually. So the next thing we need to do is before we put the door on, because once, that once that's on it's kind of a pain to work inside is on the far side, so if I have the door facing me, on the far side we're going to put, we're going to take these three long toggle bolts and we're going to put them kind of evenly spaced across here so when you turn this, it kind of stirs it up a little bit. Because if you don't have those, it kind of just tends to just slide in the bottom and the barrel rolls around but it doesn't turn. So we'll take and if you just eyeball it or measure it, drill three holes relatively evenly spaced, quarter inch holes on the on the side exactly opposite the center of the door, as best you can. This is a, yeah, just steal that one for now. There you go.
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, push, put a washer on the head there. And then, have you guys ever used toggle bolts before? Nope. Something like this? You can see there's a little nut in here and then basically instead of using like, it's made to like stick through and then it springs out and then this is the nut itself and you don't use a washer, so. You need a washer on the head side, but not on the side of the toggle part. And it can be a little challenging because you kind of have to reach to both sides of your barrel and my arms are even pretty long and it's kind of tough. So. And then if you have a Phillips head bit on a driver and if you don't, I can lend you mine, but that's the easiest way to screw it because it's a lot of threads to screw. So you need one of those washers on the on the on there, and then stick it through the barrel, and then you stick that. Yeah, once you stick it through the barrel, you stick the toggle on, and it kind of expands like this. And then when it tightens, it sucks really tight and opens up the toggle. And you might have to work together. One person hold the head, and one person put the toggle on, because it's kind of. It's challenging to do it yourself. And it might be, I don't know if it's easier to do it up on the table or not. And then basically someone will have to hold the toggle and someone will have to use a driver and drive that screw and it kind of sucks the toggle to the barrel. So. Because the wing should be coming out like this, right? And so like if this, is the if this is the surface of the barrel, the toggle should be like this and then when it sucks, it goes like this and sucks tight. Yep. Toggle bolts are just a lot easier to, like, they're a lot easier to use than an actual bolt to make something long and stick out. So ba when you buy a six inch bolt, there's, like, you can't stick a six inch bolt through and then suck the threads all the way up because on a six inch bolt, there's only two inches of threads. So you can't suck it all the way. So a toggle bolt for this works quite a bit easier. And you don't need a washer on the other side and everything, so. I would take, like I would take an impact driver and I would suck it, because that toggles like this, it'll suck all the way flat to the side. This, and you can come borrow this, and you can do it when you get home. And this is really quick to screw that toggle all the way down that six inch bolt. That screws it really quick. Yep. Yep, yep, okay, there's one back there. Just keep, just keep that one. So.
just leave it. Bruce, can you help her with that? Bring that, use that impact driver and help her with that. Are you getting it, Margaret? Yep. Okay. What do you think of toggle bolts, yay or nay? Yeah. If you're used to them, they're not so bad. But. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're to start threading it. Yeah, to, and to make sure that it's not cockeyed in there, yeah. So then one of you should just, you should just be able to hold the toggle with your fingers and then run that in. Must be, must be tight. Just about everybody's through that, I think, right? Just about? Okay. But are any of you members of the garden club in town? Or how did you guys find out about this? Right? We sent. We sent it to the garden club and they sent it out, okay. We were expecting like 10 people, so. And we got, we were doing 42 projects. I think we got like 36, 37 people. So, yeah, for something we've never done before, so that's pretty good.
So Carla, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to drill three, we're going to lay our rubber on here and we're going to drill three quarter inch holes through here and that's going to be, that's going to bolt, bolt this to here and that'll be our hinge. So you can find the right drill bit and everything. three quarter inch holes, about an inch from the end and an inch from the side on either end, and then one in the middle, kind of an inch from the edge here. So, and then what I should have done is I should have stuck this bolt through here and into this to make sure it stays still because it kind of likes to move around on you. And then I just kind of stick them in as I go so it stays still. Because this one's probably already off. So, and if you have a bigger drill bit, it'll make it easier because the when you drill through the rubber, it sucks back together. But basically, you're going to go through and you're going to drill a hole here, here, and here, and that's going to be the hinge, basically. We're going to bolt the rubber to the barrel. And what I do when I do it, so I drill the first hole and then I put the bolt in there so it stays steady or else when you try to drill this is going to slide around and all your holes are going to be off. So I drill a hole, put a bolt, drill the next hole, put the bolt in there and then do the last one and do that. Those little quarter inch by one inch bolts, yep. A washer on both sides, yep. So that should be the remaining six washers. You should add nine washers total. So if you have if you have like a five sixteenths drill bit, that would actually work better. But yeah, if you have it, makes it a little easier. Ah, oh, I forgot my. This is the first event we've actually ever live streamed, so nothing like a hands-on workshop via live stream to start it off. But it's all right. <laughs> well, and this is where your two seven sixteenths wrenches or sockets come in to suck these down a little bit.
All right. Troubles, kind of just fine but slow. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is now we have to put these snaps on. And so for anybody that has smaller drill bits, the easiest thing to do is, so on my drill I have a 5 30 seconds drill bit and I, I basically held this where it was going to be and I held that how it should be and I drilled a hole through that thing. If you only have a quarter inch drill bit and you can't drill through this small hole that was here, you'll have to just mark it and then take it off and drill it with a quarter inch. But with a toggle bolt, if, that, if the hole is extra big it doesn't really matter. Um, if you can get some, mine's a 5.30 seconds and it's perfect. A 3.16 will be too big. Okay, 5.32, I got 5.16. I'm sorry for anybody at home that only had a quarter inch drill bit, because that's what I said, and now I need like six different size drill bits. But. You guys are the guinea pigs, unfortunately. But. And then you just take your... Phillips again and suck those toggle bolts down. So once you get that drilled. So we're doing three? Yep. Three evenly spaced again, basically straight across from the bolts. Yep. Yep. Nope. Yeah, I just drilled one through that center hole. These little snaps come with little screws to attach them, but I kind of thought over time that they would probably get loose and everything. So which way does the snap go? This thing should be really sticking straight out if it's laying how it should be. Yeah, because then you can sneak your finger under it and pop it like that. There. 
So then let me pop all these and I'll show it how it should be done. It kinda, that's how it'll get snapped together. Getting it, Carla? Yeah. All right. That, you have little toggle bolts, right? Those little toggle bolts? Yep. That's what those are for. Yeah, they come with screws, but I just thought screwing through this thin plastic that it wasn't, it wouldn't hold. So. it should go So do you guys all, all already do composting of some kind? No? Okay. Yeah. Have you tried composting with worms yet? That's my next thing. All right. I think we found here Kind of worm composting is kind of if the if the Minokin farm had a the innovative thing that we're always trying to do differently, it's our worm composting now. And it's it really seems like it takes a lot of headache out of composting. Because with composting you gotta have this ratio of carbon rich brown material to nitrogen rich green material. You kind of still follow the guidelines, but then you throw some worms in there and it's like, man, it just kind of does it. So it so I know I have those two outside. I'm gonna get a pound of worms in each one and yeah, they really make a great compost. And they speed it up a lot. I will put them in there, yep. I just haven't yet, but I will this summer. Okay, okay. 
Okay. Yep. And we, we just got some worms yesterday in our big composters outside here, so. Uncle Jim's worm farm. So. But we 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 take the Oh, okay. Oh. We ordered some in the in November of 2018 and then we just ordered some some more this spring, but but we actually we have two big 400 gallon water tanks outside filled with compost and worms and a drain on the end and we collect the juice out of there and we put it on our fields when we seed. So we use it in like crop production. So, and we've seen, yeah, little big time, but, but we, I mean, you can go out and just, the worms, um, you know, we're not really feeding these ones too much. Yeah, mostly just compost, already composted material. Yeah, but when we, when we did it in the winter of 18 and 19, we, we would feed them alfalfa, coffee grounds, squash, pumpkins, uh, the really thick corn syrup that is a byproduct, by, a byproduct of ethanol production. We went to Red Trail Energy and Taylor and got a 250 gallon tote of this really thick yellow syrup. It's really nitrogen rich. So we fed him that and table scraps. Well, not really table scraps, but just kind of things like that. The kind of the things you're not supposed to feed them is citrus, just because I don't think they really touch it much. And, and meat and bones. And that's basically just, like bones is just, it takes forever to break down. Yeah. And it attracts critters and stuff, but. We haven't done any hydroponics, anything like that yet. We have, we have a garden. So, yep, so you have, you stick the, that little toggle bolt, the actual bolt part through the snap, stick it through the, stick it through the b barrel and then you put that, the toggle part, the spring part, that goes on the inside of the barrel. Yep, just like the other one, same thing. So, So you're gonna put the red wiggle Yep, and then we use European night crawlers too. They kind of live deeper because red wigglers live like in the first couple of inches, so they're all their activities at the top. Oh. But night crawlers go down a couple feet probably. So you have to, you have to order the European night crawlers? Yep, and we just got them. We put them in yesterday in our composters. So, so you don't use the night crawlers from fishing? No, no, no. Yep, yeah, we order these ones. The com roll it. Yeah. See, I haven't, th the composters I've built really haven't even had time for me to use them much. They just, they're only nine months old and they spent seven months of it froze. So they're still like, the stuff that I stuck in there last fall is still in there just like I stuck it in. So I gotta get them going this spring. But will you roll it? You yep, work. yep. And then the other thing about worms that's nice is, I think the big problem in composting is like a lack of a lack of air mostly in the pile, and then it starts to stink because it goes aerobic. So with worms, they're supposed to, all their channels are supposed to allow air throughout the pile. So they should, in theory, they should help with the odor problem. So, but. So like on our big, on our, oh, so like the, the main composting that we do, it's a system where you just feed solid material in the top and it eventually comes out a liquid at the bottom and that's what we use. Just because we have liquid fertilizer tanks on our planter, so we use worm juice instead. So, but like if you're going to use, if you're gonna vermicompost and then actually harvest the compost, like I said, the red wigglers usually live within the first couple inches. So you just scrape up the top six inches if you have a big pile and a lot of your worms are in there gather all the rest out, fill the bin again, and then put those worms back on top. They don't like light. Also, yeah. if you put the light, they'll go down deep. Okay. 
Yeah, worms have like light sensitive organs on their bodies, I guess, so yeah. But uh, what was the other thing I was gonna say? Oh, like, so when we had our, we had a bunch of bins in here, we had 28 bins full of worms in here last winter. And you know, you throw, you break a pumpkin in half and throw it on top and then come back in a couple days and you lift it up. And I mean, the pumpkin that you lift up is half red, just covered with worms. So, and they double in population every 60 to 90 days. We, we put our worms in this heated building to keep them alive, so. And in theory, their cocoons that they make or their, their eggs or whatever should survive, but these, are not, these aren't worms that just live in our soil. Because if you put these red wigglers out in the ground, they'll die because it's not the environment they like, so. So we just baby them and we bring them inside, but. Okay, so the last thing after you have all those snaps on, the other optional thing is this is just a handle but really it's not that hard to sneak your finger under there and open it. So if you want to drill another hole and put this little piece of rope, you can, or if you don't want to, you don't have to. But. So, my ones outside didn't have handles, but. So, well, that's just an optional thing. And then about the only other thing that you should do is I, the one I built yesterday, I went and I drilled seven holes across here just to allow air in. And that, because it needs, because there's not a ton of air that'll sneak in here. But if you're going to put worms in there, the worms are going to eventually find the holes too, probably. So, whether you drill a few holes. And on the ones I have outside, I just drilled kind of a larger hole right in the center. So, but it's all things to think about. I would say a vole could easily get through a half inch hole probably. You guys have any, any other questions? So what, how would we start this, what would we do? So for those of you that have compost, and so like what, like the beginner's way to do it would just be to put like grass and leaves in here. Grass and leaves? Yeah, that'd be the kind of the, when I did it is I have a community garden plot in town that I just used as a demonstration. So at the end of last season, I gathered up all my stuff. So I had like cucumber vines and tomatoes and all sorts of stuff and I like packed them completely full. And then I even had like weeds where it still had a lot of soil on it. So I threw that in there. But the thing, the thing that, uh, you know, I don't know what microbes are in there, but when we started our vermicompost, we actually bought this jug of bacteria liquid basically just to really because we were going along and it wasn't doing much and then we poured you know in a 250 gallon container we poured six ounces on it and then it just took off kind of but it'd be best if it was shredded yep yeah Uh, I wouldn't worry about fertilizer as much as I was worry about some kind of pesticide or something, but, oh, I would think that'd be fine. Um, what other thing was I going to say? When we, when we did our worm composting, so you basically have the bedding that they lived in that we filled them with and then we kind of continually fed them food on top. The bedding was straw, wood chips, shredded paper, hay, mm, I think that, and cardboard. So, and as far as cardboard goes, you know, the glue that holds the layers of cardboard together, the fungi that'll grow in the compost really like to consume the glue. So.
Yeah, I just drilled like a three eighths inch hole in here and then slipped that through and then just tied a granny knot at each end. Yeah. Yours is right in front of you. So Margaret, in your compost tumbler, how, how long would you say it complete, it takes to complete composting? Yeah, so you need two or you can do a batch process? That's where I think what, what we found with worms is it makes it easier, it speeds it up, it makes a better product. some holes maybe. <laughs> you got one right, but one was wrong. One is right, two are wrong. Are you talking about what you did too? 
So a quarter inch barrel? Yeah, I just I drilled just a row of seven on each end, yep. I think is my green one behind on the table there. Bruce had it last, but I don't know where it went. You guys all live in Bismarck, Mandan? Oh, sounds like it from how you've been talking to each other. So. Is the Garden Club still planning on doing all their tours this summer or what? I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be one of the first ones. Yeah, on the June June sixteenth, I'm supposed to partake in that one. Okay. Sure. Right, persevere. Probably not, no.
Yeah, thank you for coming. It's very encouraging that this is kind of the thing where you're like, I don't know if anybody really wants to do this, but. Yeah, I had, nothing really happened until about three weeks ago, and then I was like, oh, I guess it's going to happen, because I didn't know what. Yeah, well, it's hard so. to know, but it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, so. I've been home for two months now, yeah. so it's kind of fun. Yeah. Hopefully in the, well, I don't know. Now by the fall, I thought things would be back to normal, but, but I don't know. But eventually we'll be able to do it, and I don't know. I know it, so I learned kind of all this from a lady in, Fargo and they just go to like the city park and they do it there so we could do that or we could come out here and do it you know outside on a nice day so yeah but I don't know so yeah if you think anything you have some suggestions you can email us or call us so appreciate it because I think it went pretty well but there's always things that can be improved yeah. good Yep. I think we can just, yeah. Set that there. 